Good morning, Forest Hill Church. Jonathan Scott, campus pastor here at South Park. But so very grateful that you are joining us from wherever you're at, whether you're watching online or in one of our other campuses at Noda, Waxoff, Fort Mill, Ballantyne, South Boulevard. We're glad that you are part of what a part of what God is doing here in our church as we continue. This is our second week in this United Sermon Series that's uniting over a hundred churches seeking to be more effective in loving our neighbors. And today is a very special day as I have the privilege of being able to introduce to you kind of a brand new friend to Forest Hill Church and to the city of Charlotte, Dave Runyon, one of the co-authors of the book, The Art of Neighboring, through which we're getting some practical tips and some skills. And he's going to challenge us with a message helping us to overcome the barriers that can keep us from being effective. He hails from Denver, Colorado. He is the executive director of City Unite, an organization designed to help both companies and churches be more effective in a united effort to be able to bless those, those organizations. He is married to Lauren. He's got four kids, and he is here today of being able to help us move further. As a matter of fact, tonight, Dave's got a big, a big schedule today, but tonight he'll be back from 5 o'clock to 8 o'clock. We're going to gather as a church together, as the Church of Jesus Christ with other city leaders, uh, church leaders. We're going to be here for some awesome food at 5 o'clock, then we're going to have some cha- a chance of being able to connect with one another with recreation. So we hope that you'll come back because then Dave will offer some very practical techniques and tips to encourage our effectiveness in being able to love our neighbors. So I'm very grateful for his presence, as I'm sure you are too, to be able to hear what God has to say to us through him. So Forest Hill Church, would you please give a very warm Forest Hill welcome to our brand new friend, Dave Runyon. Thank you, Jonathan. Dave, it's a pleasure being able to have you. We're looking forward to to what God will do through you. Well, thank you. Enjoy yourself. Appreciate it. (laughs) Well, good morning, Forest Hills. It's incredible to be here with you during this joint sermon series. As Jonathan mentioned, over 100 churches all across the city of Charlotte are joining together, setting aside their own agenda, and spending three weeks sharing the same message around literal neighboring. And I think it's a beautiful thing when churches begin to stack hands and to act and function like they're on the same team, because we are on the same team. And so it's been amazing to watch what's happened here through Fort Charlotte and to see all of this evolve. What's happening here is very similar to what happened in my community, in my city, a few years ago. So I served as a pastor for 10 years in the Denver metro area. And during that time, a number of the pastors and leaders began to come together and to ask this question. If we could only do one thing in our city, if we could go after one thing together, as the church, what's the smartest thing that we could do? And as we started to ask that question, first of all, we realized we didn't know the answer. And that was obviously an indictment on us as pastors. But once we got over that, we started to gather with local civic leaders. And so we went and set up these rooms where we would have the pastors in a room, then we'd invite in the police chief or the city manager. And a few years ago, we were sitting in the room with our mayor and we asked him, if you could wave a magic wand and change something in our city, what would you change? And he had a number of things that he listed off to us. He wanted to live in a city without elderly shut-ins and without single moms below the poverty line and with no financial debt. And he had all of these great things. But at the end, he said something in passing that really just changed the trajectory for all of our churches. He said, you know, if you guys want to have the biggest impact in our community, you should start some kind of a neighboring movement. And then he kind of just went on. We're like, no, no, go back to that. He said, yeah, you know, what we're learning is that We could start more programs for people who are in need, or some of those people could live on a block in an apartment complex where they're known by their literal neighbors. And through those relationships, they would be cared for, and they wouldn't even need the programs that we're trying to raise money for and keep afloat. And as he said that, you could just feel like this huge, like, silence fall in our room. And we just started to say, oh, no. Our mayor is telling us to do the Bible Like, can you imagine what that felt like if you're a pastor, you make your living or like helping people orient their lives around this. And then when your mayor says, hey, you know what the smartest thing that you can do in your city is? You should think about like that thing that Jesus said, that love your neighbor thing. You guys should actually do it. And that rattled all of us in that room. And that sent my friends and I and our churches on an exciting journey. And... Um, as you know, last week we, we did this little block map exercise during week one of this sermon series. This little tool right here, this is what had a huge, huge impact. This is the secret sauce to what happened in my community. Churches all across the city 
are doing this together. And I know that this works. I've seen it happen over and over and over again. And so, like, how many of you right now, go ahead and just raise your hand. How many of you, you've learned in the last seven days, you learned at least one new name of a neighbor? Go ahead and raise your hand up. That's, that's incredible. People actually doing something because of a sermon, okay? Now, how many of you have no idea what I'm talking about right now? Okay, keep, keep your hand up. Look around. Those are all the people that didn't go to church last week, okay? So for you, I'm just going to give you a quick little recap. Here's what we talked about last week, and we basically it was just this. Um, if you're a Christian, it would be a good idea if you know your neighbor's first names. And this right here is a little tool that'll help you do that. So if you weren't here last week, grab this, put it up on your fridge. This will help you to start to fill this in, start to have a series of mildly awkward conversations with your neighbors who you've lived next to for a while and admit that you forgot their name or whatever that might be, and then just start writing down their names this will help you learn and retain and use the names of the people who live right around you. And what we learned in our city is that just doing that, just doing that often sets you on a trajectory. It, helps, it just helps you get going. And so much of momentum is just getting going. And with some of your neighbors, it'll start by going, hey, man, to hey, Matt. And then to hey, Matt. Like, did you see the end of that Carolina game? And then it'll just start to, things will start to open up from there. And so trust me, just if you're willing to just simply learn and retain and use your neighbor's names, you'll be shocked at what happens. And we're setting the bar super low. We're not asking you to love your neighbor. Okay, that's crazy like Jesus stuff. We're just saying, hey, would you just be willing to learn and retain and use their names? And we're saying that because we know it's a Trojan horse. That if you're willing to do that, the kingdom will start to break out in your neighborhood. And so it's going to be amazing to see what happens when Forest Hill and over 100 other churches in this city just start making it really concrete, this idea of loving your neighbor, making it really clear and really concrete. And so this week, we're going to talk about one of the biggest obstacles to, to loving our neighbor. And I want to share a text with you that's been the theme of this series. It's found in Acts chapter 17. Paul is in Athens. He's giving one of the great sermons in the New Testament about the character and the nature of God. And during this sermon in Acts 17, 26 and 27, he says this, from one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us. If you believe this, it will change the way you drive in and out of your neighborhood. If you believe this, you'll start to have a thick theology of place. You'll start to realize that there's something sacred happening right outside your front door. And I just want to encourage you to, as each week as we read through this text and reflect on it, I want you to think about what would it look like for you to take this seriously? What if Jesus meant, when he said love your neighbor, what if he meant your actual neighbors too? And what would it look like for you to begin to engage with those people? Because here's the deal. If you do you're gonna be guaranteeing yourself that you're not living in the Christian bubble. Because if you start to get to know the people who live right around you, you will for sure be spending some time with people who think about the world totally differently than you do. And I think that's part of the genius of taking the great commandment literally and seriously is that it gets you, it has you rubbing shoulders with people who don't think about the world the same way that you do. And I think that's what the gospel is all about. That's where it thrives. And we see that over and over and over again throughout the text. Now, my guess is that as many of you walked out of here last week, you were somewhat conflicted. On one hand, you heard Jason or Jonathan teach about this idea of literal neighboring. And you're like, all right, I'm motivated. I want to do that. And then you probably had this thought of like, how in the world do I have time for one more thing? One more of all the things that I'm juggling. How in the world am I going to have time for one more relationship, much less eight of them? And if you felt that way, I want to reassure you that you are not alone at all. I think this is the biggest obstacle that we have to face if we're going to start engaging with our actual neighbors. And so today I'd like us to spend a few minutes wrestling with this question. Are we living at a pace that allows us to be available to those who live around us? We live in a world that values production and results and activity, and we often move from one task to another. Our inboxes always seem full, even though we're trying to like respond and delete to each email, right? It seems like my to-do list continues to grow no matter how much time I put in that day. 
And have you ever thought about the fact that you and I have more time-saving devices available to us than any people group in the history of the world? But at the same time, we feel like we have less time than ever. I mean, if someone would have sat you down 20 years ago and told you, hey, listen, in 20 years, you're going to have the ability, instead of like flying somewhere to have a meeting, you have the ability to like sit in your home, halfway in your pajamas, and to meet with somebody face to face for an hour and a half and then turn it off and go on with your day. Or if they would have told you, listen, you're going to be able to like actually talk on your phone in the car. And while you're doing that, you can send mail to other people while you're talking on the phone and driving your car. Or you're going to have machines that allow you to capture whatever TV show you want to watch or sporting that you want to watch. And instead of you having to orient your schedule around that show, you're just going to be able to have it on demand. If somebody would have come and said these things to you 20 years ago, a logical thought would have been, oh my goodness, what am I going to do with all of my spare time, right? And that's what I would have thought. I thought, oh my, I'm going to be able to get all of these things done. I'm going to have so much leisure time. All these things that I've been dreaming about doing, I'm finally going to be able to do. But that is not, is what, that's not what's happened to us. Instead, we just jammed more and more and more things onto our plate. Instead of taking advantage of some of these things that we have access to, we just feel this force that this causes us to go, I gotta do more, I gotta do more, I gotta do more. I think there's these different cultural myths that drive us to live in this way, to live at this pace in which we take on more and more and more. So one of the myths is that we tell ourselves someday things will settle down. Okay, you, ever, you look at somebody close to you and go, I just got to get through this month and then it's going to be so much better. Like when I say that to my wife now, she actually just laughs at me openly. And then she, I catch myself and I realize, oh, I'm doing it again. Things will settle down in one of two ways, like when you die or when you get intentional about living at a healthy pace, about maybe saying no to some things that you're involved in and really reflecting on things that you've drifted into that might not be at the center of what God wants you to be at the center of. So the second myth is this. I think some, sometimes we say, someday more is gonna be enough. If I just had this job, this promotion, if I was just in this relationship, or if I just had this thing, if I could just get to the right house, if I could finally just get this, then, then things, I'll, I'll be less anxious. I'll be less driven in this crazy way. And the truth is this, there's not a single one of us in this room that's one purchase or two or three away from contentment. And yet it's easy to live in a way where we think that's gonna be true. The third thing that I, the third myth that I think is prevalent is it's easy for us to think everybody lives like this. Everyone lives like this, it's just how it is. And I just have to deal with it. And while it may seem that like everyone lives like this, the truth is that everyone does not live like this. In fact, Jesus says there's a different way to live. And this morning we're gonna take a look at a story in which Jesus teaches about a different way of living. It's found in Luke chapter 10. It's a story that directly follows the Good Samaritan passage. If you have a Bible, you can turn there now or we'll have it up on the screen. I love that this church stands when they're reading through the text each week. And so I'd invite you, if you're able, to go ahead and stand up right now as we read through this passage. Again, we're in Luke 10, starting verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened up her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him, to Jesus, and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. You may be seated. Let's unpack this a little and see what we can learn from these two sisters. First, let's look at Martha. The key phrase that describes Martha is that she was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. Martha's busyness caused her to miss out on an opportunity to be with Jesus and with others. And at first glance, it looks like Martha's the one that gets it. She cares so much about Jesus that she takes the initiative to open up her home and begin to prepare a meal for him. 
But as we take a closer look, we learn that Martha has become distracted. She is rushed and she hurries to get everything done and she misses the main thing. Has this ever happened to you? Have you been like so dialed in on the details to something big that you got so focused in and you missed out on the thing that you were preparing for? One of the great privileges I get as a pastor is to be a part of performing wedding ceremonies. And one of the things that I've noticed is that oftentimes we'll go through the whole ceremony and then I get this moment to be in the back and we're signing the marriage certificate or whatever it might be. And many times I've seen one, either the groom or the bride, look at the other and go, was that it? Is it it really over? It felt like such a blur. And I just think to myself, oh, no. You got so focused in on the preparations that had to be made for this massive event and the checklist and everything that you actually missed it. And one of the things that Jesus is teaching us here is that there's a danger of missing the point when it comes to our spiritual lives. That's what happened to Martha. A book that has had a significant impact on my life is The Life You've Always Wanted by John Ortberg. And one of the most powerful parts of the book is when Ortberg states that hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life in our day. He coins this phrase, hurry sickness. He goes on to say that the reason why hurrying is so dangerous is because love and hurry are not at all compatible because love always takes time and time is the one thing that hurried people don't have. Let me say that again. Love always takes time and time is the one thing that hurried people don't have. In our relationships, whether it be with our spouses, our kids, our coworkers, our neighbors, hurry is toxic. It's toxic. This hit home for me in a big way a number of years ago. I was hunting with one of my neighbors. I had not spent a lot of time with him in that setting before. And he looked at me as we're out there and he goes, you know, it's been really good to get to know you in this setting. It's really changed the way that I think about you. Now, I should have been smart and just gone on and not dug into that, but I didn't. So I leaned in. I'm like, whoa, what does that mean? And he's like, no, nothing. It's just, and I go, no, no, what, like, please tell me what you're talking, what, what do you mean? And he said, I don't know, Dave. A lot of times I feel like when we interact in the neighborhood, it just feels like there's always someplace else that you need to be. And as I heard him say that, I, I realized that he's right. I do have this tendency oftentimes where I'm trying to like, I, I want to say hi or find out how somebody's doing, but I just had this tendency to live in a way where I'm like going somewhere else really quickly. Now, for me, that was an aha moment. It was a, hey Dave, you're doing the Martha thing moment. And I think it's interesting and important for us to take note of exactly what Martha was doing. What she was doing wasn't bad. She invited Jesus into her home and she was preparing a meal for Jesus. Martha gets reprimanded for literally serving Jesus. She's doing ministry. This should mess with us, okay? She's not just like binge watching Netflix. What she's doing is a good thing. And I think that this is one of the things that makes this text so powerful. Jesus is saying that sometimes we have to learn to say no to good things in order to center our lives on the main thing. Sometimes we have to say no to good things to center our life on the main thing. Now, let's turn our attention to Mary. As we look at Mary, as we read this passage, it's important for us to understand what's going on here culturally. This one sentence, Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said, is loaded with significance. In the Hebrew culture, to sit at somebody's feet indicates a relationship between a teacher and a rabbi. So Mary's act of sitting at Jesus' feet goes against a number of cultural norms. Women aren't supposed to be students, not in this culture. Women were certainly not supposed to be disciples of a rabbi. Women were supposed to be in the kitchen helping their sisters with the meal. A woman's worth, her identity was intertwined with her ability to be a great host. But Mary goes against the cultural norms of her day because her life is centered on the main thing. She realizes what it's all about, and then she acts on that realization. We read that only one thing is needed. Mary knows what it is, and she lives it out. Now, in order to be like Mary, we must learn how to step out of our cultural norms and enter into God's presence. We must learn when to work and when not to work. And unfortunately, in our society, living at a pace in which we are present in our neighborhoods, and we're present with others, has become countercultural. 
If we're going to be good neighbors, then we actually have to make time to simply be in our neighborhood. And for many of us, I think we need to learn the art of elimination. How many of you have ever had the privilege of, of being, going to Florence and seeing Michelangelo's David statue? A few of you. I was there about 15 years ago, and if you go there and do the little tour guide thing, they tell this story, kind of an urban legend story, about a person who was looking at this magnificent statue and looked at Michelangelo and said, like, tell me, like, what's the process? How did you do it? And Michelangelo said, I, I just took this huge piece of stone and then I removed everything that wasn't a masterpiece. Not the most humble statement ever, but it's fascinating. Michelangelo knew the art of elimination. And I think it's something that all of us, if we could learn how to practice this, it would help us to be more and more present and have the ability, the margin, to be really engaged in the places that God has put us. When I first started down this road, I started to think about the number of nights that I wasn't actually home, that I wasn't in my neighborhood. And a big reason for that is that I was sitting on three different boards and I started to think about what would happen if I was able to be a little bit more present in my neighborhood and what would happen if I wasn't sitting in some of those board meetings. Now, I loved these nonprofits. Like, I was passionate about what they were doing. But the truth is, me not being there wasn't going to be the end of the world. In many of those meetings, it didn't make an impact at all. But it kept taking me away from the place where I slept and lived it kept taking away opportunities for me to cross paths with the people that God had put right around me. And so I made a decision to have some hard conversations and to say, hey, listen, I just feel like I'm supposed to be in my neighborhood more than I am right now. And I wish I could do this and continue to do it, but I just don't feel called to at this time. Now, I don't know what it might be for you when you think about what are the things that continually take you out of your neighborhood, but I would encourage you to just pray about that and to say, God, have I drifted into some things that I actually shouldn't be involved in so that I can be a little bit more present, so I can be a little bit more available right where you put me? Now, I think we could all agree that Jesus got a lot done, right? Would you agree? It's interesting to note, though, Jesus never seems hurried. He doesn't seem like a rushed, like, ambitious, driven, you know, like I'm just going to live at this crazy pace with my hair on fire, right? He, he says, no, there, there's a better way to live, to live like to be engaged, but to also be intentional about resting and pulling away. And I think this is, would be one of the great apologetics for our culture. What I've come to find is that many of my friends, people that don't yet know God, are sick and tired of living like maniacs, like living like their hair is on fire and being in, just going from one thing to the next to the next and then coming home and getting their garage door up and coming in and getting their garage door down and detoxing from everything that just happened that day and then doing it all over again. And I think one of the greatest opportunities for us to like talk about the way that Jesus talks about living and to show people there's a different way to live is to live at a pace in which we're available and which we're interruptible, in which when we're working, we work hard, and when we're not working, we don't work. I think we're at a time where in our world where people are craving this, but too often, we're actually living just like them. What would it look like to take Jesus seriously, to emulate the way that he lives? I think we've got a world that's craving that. And it's going to take a lot of courage on our part. It's going to take a lot of effort to be intentional and to live differently, to, to live more like Mary than like Martha. I, for me, most of my favorite interactions with Jesus actually take place along the way. They take place because he's interruptible. It, it takes place because like, it happens in, the, in passing. It happens in the moment, and he is being present with people because he can, because he's, he's living in a way that provides margin to do that. When you look at your calendar, how much does it match up with the command to love God and love your neighbor? Is God asking you to live differently? What God asks you to do, he might be asking you to give up something that might seem countercultural. 
I would argue that's okay. Mary's story shows us that at times we have to live counterculturally in order to center our lives on what matters most. In order to do this, you might have to say no to some really good things. That's okay as well. Martha's story shows us that sometimes you have to say no to good things in order to be centered and dialed in with great things. And here's the deal. Like, this doesn't take a ton of time. Like, it, does, it takes time. We have to live at a pace. But sometimes, like, little things, just being available, being, like, willing to see what God's up to in your neighborhood make a huge, huge difference. A while back, I was out front. My neighbor was out front, and he was working on his yard. My neighbor's yard looks like the fairway on a golf course. Mine doesn't. They're right by each other. And I just looked at him, and I just said, hey, Rod, help me make sense of this. Okay, very simple question. And he just, like, comes alive. He just, like, goes off, and he's like, okay, so January, and then he's like, now mid-January, then I do this. And, then I, and I mean, he took me all the way through the year. And I remember just like listening and listening. It was like a, it was like a seven-minute sermon. And I remember he got to the end. And I remember thinking to myself, this totally isn't worth it. <laughs> now, but that's not what I said. What I said was fascinating. Fascinating. And, and there was something really important that happened just by spending those eight minutes, just by one being available, being in my front yard, and then just by taking eight minutes to listen to somebody, there was this exchange of like passion and interest on his behalf. And and there was some kind of dignity and relationship building that happened just by being able to sit and ask a question. And that takes, that takes time. It takes, not, not much, but it does take time. And so as you leave here today, as you go on your way out, I want to encourage you to take some time this week to linger in your front yard, or if you live in an apartment or a condo, to hang out in the common space and to see what God does, to just be available, be aware, realize that there's something sacred happening, that you're placed where you are for a reason. The people who are around you, they're there for a reason too. And what the text says in Acts is that so that when they reach out for God, that they'll have handles to grab onto. How cool is that? That they'll have handles to grab onto. And so what my friends and I have learned is this, is that if you will take this and put it on your fridge and use it, start to fill in these different squares. And and I know your neighborhood doesn't look like this, okay? So just think about, you walk out your front door, what are the eight closest units or houses to you? And if you will put this on your refrigerator and and just begin to like allow this to be a way that you can remember your neighbor's names and to use them when you see them. If you'll do that, and then if you will like pray this dangerous prayer, and the prayer goes like this, God, what's the next small step that you want me to take with one of my neighbors? And I'll tell you what, as I pray that prayer over and over again, I find that God will just, a little thought or a nudge will come into my head. And it's usually, it's simple. It's like, what's the next small step you want me to do with one of my neighbors? Maybe it's that, that couple that you've been saying you're going to have over for like two years. What if you actually had them over? So I feel like sometimes God will say that to me. Or, hey, like that one guy who used to talk to quite a bit, you haven't seen him in a while. Like, why don't you just go and check in and see what's going on in his life? Just that, it's a dangerous prayer. Because it makes this idea of engaging with your literal neighbors really, really concrete. And by the way, that's what we're doing here over these three weeks. This, this is a little scorecard for you to figure out how well you're doing when it comes to your actual literal neighbors. And I know some of your neighbors aren't going to want to be your friend. That's okay. Don't stalk them. That's a really bad idea. But some of your neighbors are going to be open. Some of your neighbors, as you lean a little bit towards them, they're going to lean a little bit towards you. Some of your neighbors are dying for somebody to like just go barely below the surface with them. To be the kinds of people that ask, hey, like, I noticed, like, you're really passionate about your lawn. Tell me what all you're doing over there. Hey, how did you become an engineer? Hey, your kids are, like, a little bit older than mine. Um, What do you wish you would have known about parenting 10 years ago when you were in my season of life? These are the kinds of, of questions and conversations that are all, they're all just waiting for you. And for much of my life, I was so busy 
doing ministry and outreach events of the church and all kinds of different things. I was so busy doing all those things that I was missing. I was missing out on like really taking the great commandment literally and seriously. And what I've come to learn is this, is that the way that Jesus talks about living, it really is the best way to live. And last week we talked about this idea of sometimes we try to find loopholes to get out of it. When we stop doing that, when we go back to the basics, when we draw a circle around the places that God has put us and begin to work out from there, great things happen. One of the things that I love about what's happening about this church right now is that your leadership believes in this. It, they want this to be not just a, a three-week sermon series with a bunch of other churches, but to be a value that is lived out here at Forest Hill. And I can't wait to see what God is going to do as a result. Would you pray with me? God, thanks for giving us this incredible command that has the potential to do so much for us and for those who live around us. God, give us a passion and a desire to really begin to engage with the people that you put right around us. Help us make the time to build relationships with those who live 20, 30, 40, 50 feet away from our front door. Give us the courage to live the kind of lives that you want us to live. In your name, amen. It has been a privilege to be here and to share part of my story with you. And I do I want to invite you to come back tonight. Uh, we're going to be at the South Park campus, so don't come to where you are. Come, we're all going to come back to the South Park campus, and we're just going to dive in and dig a little bit deeper and get some practical tools and to do a lot of Q&A about what happens when you start doing this and what does it look like. So hopefully I can see you there tonight. I think it's around 6 o'clock, and I'm looking forward to it. Thanks.